Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to open the hearing on House Bill 442 uh, relative to use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. And recognize, if I could, the prime sponsor, Representative Merrick. Before uh, Representative Merrick starts to testify, I've got. Uh, Two sheets of folks that would like to either be registered in support of the bill or opposition to the bill, um, speaking or not speaking. Um, we have a long afternoon because in order to utilize this room, which would accommodate all of you, we're going to have a subsequent hearing on Lyme's disease, which will attract a similar number of people. So I would ask everybody to um, be as brief as possible, except of course for the prime sponsor. Thank, Thank you. you, and I will try to be as brief as possible also. Uh, good morning, honorable senators, and thank you for allowing me the privilege of testifying before you today. For the record, I am Evelyn Merrick, I'm representing Co-op District 2, which includes the towns of Stratford, Stark, Grove, and Northumberland, Lancaster, Randolph, Twin Mountain, Jefferson, Dalton. Whitefield, I think I've got them all. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis and hopefully there will be people behind me that will fill in the gaps. Uh, HB 442 has come before this committee because it is about health care. And I hope to convince you that cannabis, which we know is often referred to as marijuana, should be a legally available therapeutic medicinal option that it is specifically and solely designed to provide much needed relief for patients suffering from debilitating medical conditions, life-threatening illnesses, and terminal diseases. These individuals desperately need an alternative to legally prescribe pharmaceuticals that for some has proven to be insufficient in easing their suffering. This is not the first time this issue has come before our legislature. As you may know, as recently as October 2009, we came within two Senate votes shy from overriding the veto by Governor Lynch to accomplish the voting effort. And in fact, New Hampshire has a history of legalized medicinal cannabis on the books, which you will be hearing about later on through another testimony. HB 442 continues to address the concerns of the governor's veto message of what was then HB 648, and is the product of hours, days, and years of study and work, including a committee of conference, and most recently input from the DHHS, creating once again the tightest, most carefully crafted bill in the country. Despite the ongoing political debate regarding the legality of medical cannabis, clinical investigations of the therapeutic use of cannabinoids are, ne are now more prevalent than any other time in history. In February 2010, investigators at the University of California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, using a series of randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials, concluded that cannabis ought to be the first-line treatment, and I quote, first-line treatment for patients with neuropathy, a condition associated with MS, diabetes, spinal cord injury, chemotherapy, HIV and AIDS, and other serious illnesses. In fact, cannabis is the only medicine proven to specifically target neuropathic pain. Marijuana has been proven highly effective in alleviating symptoms and side effects of certain diseases and chronic illnesses, including glaucoma, Lou Gehrig's disease, muscular dystrophy, Crohn's disease, and agitation from Alzheimer's disease. It is proven to stimulate appetites of cancer and HIV patients who notoriously suffer from severe wasting syndrome which is the inability to eat, which creates muscle wasting, um, loss of weight enough to actually cause somebody's demise. The National Cancer Institute confirms that the use of cannabis delivers therapeutic benefits more effectively than Marinol, which is a laboratory produced synthetic pill containing only one component, which is the THC, of the cannabis plant. It also found that cannabis consistently reduced patients' pain levels to a degree that was as good as or better than currently available medications and treatments, and it is remarkably safe. 
As the American Public Health Association noted in its official position statement, marijuana has an extremely wide acute margin of safety for use under medical supervision and does not cause lethal reactions. That cannot be said about many drugs that doctors prescribe every day, including many over-counter medications such as acetaminophen, which is uh, estimated to cause approximately 500 deaths per year and thousands of emergency room visits and admissions every year. We know many frequently prescribed and lethal drugs are often abused, are highly addictive, and are often stolen out of a patient's medicine cabinet to be sold on the street. Most significantly, the consumption of marijuana, regardless of quantity or potency, cannot induce a fatal overdose. According to a review, review prepared for the World Health Organization, there are no recorded cases of overdose fatalities attributed to cannabis, and the estimated lethal dose for humans extrapolated from animal studies is so high, no pun intended, that it cannot be achieved by the user. The evolution of 442 takes all the current research and data into consideration, along with the concerns not addressed in the previous bill. I'll make some uh, important distinctions briefly. It assures there are none of the loopholes that allow for California or Colorado's abuse for profit making enterprise. The bill is so carefully <coughs> crafted that it would be impossible for the uncontrolled distribution system visa in California to ever occur in New Hampshire. HB 442 is as different from the laws in those states as we are in the miles apart. HB 442 has defined in statute a very limited number of debilitating medical conditions that may be treated with medical cannabis. It is limited to patients who are registered by the state, who are qualified by and overseen by their physician, and who suffer from only those conditions and symptoms that have failed other long-term treatments or presently available medications, and those that are listed in the bill. Requires patients to register with the DHHS uh, and carry an ID that identifies them as qualified patients at all times. This bill protects the employer and the landlord. Language within the bill states that an employee or tenant must abide by the current laws and is restricted within those laws as to the use of medical cannabis based on the same laws that govern prescribed narcotics. Much of the cost of the state are covered through fundraising efforts and revenue collected through licensing, <coughs> registration, and IDPs, patients and providers, and financial gifts allowable under the law. It is a cost savings bill because it ultimately reduces health care costs to the state to reduce Medicaid reimbursement <coughs> and decrease utilization of emergency medical services. Excuse me, sorry. It has safeguards in place to prevent unauthorized amounts to be distributed and will limit the allowable dose under the law. Reduces the strain on our law enforcement system. HB442 is designed to decrease illegal procurement by giving registered, medically approved patients and their caregiver a safe, legal, controlled, growing environment overseen by the Department of Health and Human Services. Assuring a consistent, high quality medicine uh, that is allowable under the law. I'm sorry, a high quality medicine where patients will be able to receive a limited amount of the medicine. Law enforcement officials still have the same ability to arrest any person who violates the letter of the law, and in fact, will spend less time making arrests for the illegal use, as patients will now be able to obtain medical cannabis from a legal source, freeing up our law enforcement agents to prosecute people engaging in criminal activity plaguing our communities. Guaranteed alternative treatment centers will provide safe, legal, controlled growing environments, assuring a consistent, high-quality medicine where patients will be able to receive a limited amount of medical cannabis. Does not allow growing in patients' homes. Requires every person involved in operation of alternative treatment centers go through a state and federal background check and fingerprinting. And it cannot be expanded without coming back to the legislature. It has long been established that our health care professionals are entrusted with the amelioration of pain and suffering. Today, these professionals are, find themselves mired in controls that work in direct opposition to that goal. HB 442 allows the physician and patient to have a safe, effective alternative that works to enhance the quality of life of that patient. States which have legalized the use of cannabis for medicinal purposes have seen hundreds of patients easing their suffering because they are able to make those sound medical decisions with their physicians. 
Doctors in these states where medicinal cannabis is legal have testified that this medicine, when used as recommended, has been able to reduce or entirely eliminate their patient need for narcotic pain relievers. And as of July 2010, the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is a division of the federal government, has approved the use of marijuana for veterans as an effective medicine as long as they are living in states where medicinal use is legal. Many of these veterans have been able to effectively reduce their <coughs> dependency on dangerous opioids and in some cases have eliminated their need entirely as well. We have an obligation to give that same hope of relief to our New Hampshire veterans as well. As Senator Kelly so eloquently said recently, there is little doubt that even one person in this building has not been touched by physical and emotional suffering due to a chronic condition or disease, whether from a personal struggle or that of a family member, friend, or relative. I am one of many examples, though there are far more con compelling stories yet to be heard. I'm challenged with an incurable form of blood cancer called multiple myeloma, and Geraldine Ferrara just passed away from that same disease, that affects my blood cells, bones, and immune system. The treatments I have endured as a result of a stem cell transplant and subsequent ongoing chemotherapies to keep the cancer at bay continue to cause severe side effects. I attribute the fact that I survived that experience in large part to my short and limited experience with medical cannabis while trying to recover from the transplant eight years ago. I was literally starving to death from the inability to eat or drink yet no prescribed pharmaceutical was able to address the problem. A suggestion and an offer from a friend was all it took to jumpstart my engine. It was a risky choice, and I was hesitant, but desperate for recovery, I was left with no other choice. HB442 will give that choice to so many patients without fear of prosecution, arrest, or incarceration. I ask you to put aside fear, inaccurate information, and preconceived notions about medical cannabis. Please, don't discount, discount the suffering of so many. I ask you to protect the people, these people, the people that you serve. Provide them with a chance for a better quality of life during their suffering and in their dying days. Please pass HB 442 and send this very critical piece of legislation to the full Senate so we may provide hope to all our constituents in need. And I thank you for your time and I will entertain any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Merrick. I, I think you will be available to work for the committee as we consider this bill. And given that there are an awful lot of people that, uh, unless somebody has a question, I'm going to release you knowing that you can come back. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so very much. much. Um, I want to give special thanks to Representative Corrigan and Representative Cohen, who uh, both support the bill, but declined to speak. Um, there are a number of other reps who uh, have indicated they wish to speak. I would hope that you would keep your remarks as brief as possible because we have a room full of people. Um, so, since uh, Representative Smith has an amendment, I'm going to call on him uh, first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Representative Will Smith from Rockingham 18, covering the towns of Ryan, Newcastle. The amendment that I propose to this bill is intended to support the bill, uh, and there are five areas that uh, it covers. Um, the first, and I, I hope your pages are labeled approximately the same as mine, but the first one is on page six, which is on section, which is section five. And this one is uh, a, a 5A says, uh, no school or landlord may refuse to enroll or lease to otherwise penalize uh, an individual solely for the status of uh, uh, being a registered qualifying patient. And I would recommend that uh, that only public schools be covered by this restriction, that private schools be able to make their own decisions on these issues, and the same thing true for landlords. So I, so the first step of my amendment would be to just change 
uh, to no public school may refuse to enroll. And I think this is more in keeping with uh, freedom from, for, for, for all to decide to on their own. First, if I apologize, page six, section six. I don't think it lines up. So I, we're just going to have to hear the testimony. So I will, I will then just state Again, that. Again, Representative Smith sense. can work with me afterwards. The second uh, area was a very, uh, is a technical uh, correction, uh, which would merely change the word simply in one of the in paragraph 10 to solely. I think it's a more appropriate legal term. It has no, this is a, that's a technical uh, recommendation. Uh, in 1C, which is in my case page later on, and it's uh, in that same, it's 126-B colon 3 departmental administration. Uh, in 1C, the requirement is that if you're going to be uh, 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 applying for an identification card, you would need to give name, residential, and mailing address and date of birth of the qualifying patient except that if the applicant is homeless, no residential address is required. I believe this is a risk in the bill for um, uh, uh, to elicit, um, to not have an address. I think each person should have an address. If the person is homeless, they probably need to identify where, what building they're in front of or some other uh, requirements. So I, I think every patient should be identified in terms of address. That's my third uh, proposal in this um, amendment. Uh, and the on the, on the section two, uh, the, uh, the the department shall not issue a registry identification card to a qualifying patient who is under the age of 18. Uh, there have been uh, studies by in the medical profession, and I had asked Representative Joe Hagan to be here to talk about that in more detail. Unfortunately, he was called away to, to Washington. Uh, and he left me his notes, which I will leave with the committee, but, uh, with respect to issues associated with marijuana use by younger people. And so I would propose that section be changed to be no registration card for anyone under the age of 21, which is consistent with alcohol, uh, 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 use of alcohol uh, in our society. Uh, I, could, I could talk about that in greater detail, but I will leave his notes and I'll work with the committee in terms of uh, numerous uh, scientific and popular science-oriented, um, uh, both in the United States and abroad, having to do with the issues for the younger mind of, of the use of marijuana. Uh, and then the final uh, area that I would recommend, and I will leave this uh, proposed amendment with the committee, right here, and the notes. Uh, and the last word was the, uh, the there was in section um, four B B three uh, item four uh, there was a long description description of the procedures for doing criminal background checks but there's nothing stated in there in terms of what would happen if this this uh, this uh, procedure resulted in finding anything about the person's background so I suggested but the committee may wish to find something else to suggest. But I, uh, I uh, uh, just uh, suggested that the department, um, the, uh, the results, the department at its discretion may reject an application to be designated, to be a designated caregiver or alternative treatment center agent, depending on the find what the findings are of the, uh, of the criminal investigation. Otherwise, I don't understand why you do a criminal investigation if you're, there's nothing to be done. So those are my uh, my comments and my recommendation. And very good. And, and you'll be able to work with me. And I'll be delighted to work with you. Hey, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the chair will next call on the co-sponsor, Representative uh, Shalman. 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 Shalman, yeah, sorry. Senator, I have written testimony for myself. I'm here actually to read testimony from someone who couldn't come up from Virginia, so I can wait if you'd like okay. to take another red If that's convenient for you guys. Then just do get back to me, please. Okay. Um, Senator Forsythe, uh, do you wish to testify? Um, sure, I'll be brief. Well, God bless you. Thank <laughs> 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 you, Senator Forsythe from Senate District 4, uh, Western Lakes Region. Um, I want to testify as a co-sponsor in support of uh, Senate Bill 442. Um, last, last fall when I was knocking on doors and going around the district, 
I knocked on a gentleman's door who was a conservative Republican, uh, frustrated with the increase in spending, um, ex-Air Force um, veteran, and, uh, but at the same time, he had a medical condition and uh, uh, desired to have medical marijuana. Um, so this is not a Republican or a Democrat issue. This is a nonpartisan issue. For me, it's a matter of not getting between the doctor and the patient. Uh, medical marijuana is, is safer, less addictive than drugs like morphine or oxycontin. Uh, so it's inconsistent to make it illegal. Um, so I would urge uh, my conservative friends uh, to also support this bill. It is about getting the, the, the government out of the doctor-patient relationship. And uh, this bill is a true medical marijuana bill, unlike California or some other states who have gotten kind of backward legalization using a medical marijuana bill. Uh, this, this one is true medical marijuana as opposed to that. So I urge you to support 442. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, the chair would next recognize uh, Representative Phil Beliso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in light of the amount of people here, I need to put my to the subcommittee as well. Thank you. Uh, Representative Merrill. I just want to make sure that I recognize all the reps. I have four pages here, so is there any? Yeah, Rich, I'm sorry. Please, Representative DiPomento. It will be very, very brief. Thank you, Senator Brown. For the record, my name is Rich Dipomento, representing Rockingham District 16, which supports Mr. Newington. I am a co-sponsor of this uh, legislation and a strong supporter of it. As a retired healthcare professional, unfortunately, I saw too many folks that could have benefited from the use of medical marijuana and suffered on needlessly. Uh, so I'd like you to hear from the folks behind us who really have their stories to tell. So I thank you and hope you support this legislation. Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> uh, Representative Hafner. Uh, Hillsboro 27. Okay, sorry about that. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished senators. My story is a bit personal. Spent 26 years in the Army, retired as a sergeant major. Last February, when it was time to hear the testimony, since I'm on Health and Human Services Committee, I went into that testimony with the thoughts and opinions that no way in the world I was going to approve this or vote to approve it. In the military, we're taught that marijuana is bad, all drugs are bad. Well, during that testimony, there happened to be a young lady in the back of the room who was in a wheelchair. And um, when I looked at her, I said, my goodness, she looks awfully familiar. She looks just like my daughter. My daughter has muscular dystrophy, spinal, muscul spinal muscular atrophy. She was supposed to have passed away by the time she was 14. She is now 26 and doing fairly well. Uh, it has recently hit the lungs a year ago, which has made it more difficult for her, so she now has a trach that she has to live with constantly. After the committee received the testimony, I went back and talked to this young lady that was sitting in the back of the room in a wheelchair, and I, I said, do you mind if I ask what you have? And she said, yes, I have muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy. And I said, well, don't take me as being rude, but you look pretty good for spinal muscular atrophy. And um, you have to paraphrase looking good. In her case, looking good is not looking good in our world, but looking good in muscular dystrophy world. And in the muscular dystrophy world, she looked fairly well. Uh, my daughter is, and I have to be careful how I say it because I was quoted previously that I said that she looked like an African refugee that hadn't eaten many wounds. And my ex-in-laws took quite offense to that terminology. So I will not repeat that. <laughs> Please don't quote me on that. She's extremely skinny. Spinal muscular atrophy hits the muscles and does not allow any muscles to grow on the body. So. Uh, that creates a requirement that fat becomes a lot more important. So anytime we can help an individual eat more and keep more down and help the appetite, we want to go ahead and do that. Well, this girl had said that she had used medical marijuana in the past and that had helped her to do that. 
my daughter, to the best of my knowledge, being a young adult, has never used marijuana. Um, and like I said, if you'd asked me in February, I'd have said, I hope she never does use marijuana. But since it would appear, and based upon a lot of the test results and a lot of medical decisions, that would it would assist her in getting a better quality of life. I completely changed my attitude about it, and I support medical marijuana if it is in accordance with the bill that we currently have, with no more amendments. I think the bill is an excellent written bill. The sponsor has done a wonderful job. It has gone through the system many times. It has been beat up and beat down and brought back up. And don't compare this bill, please, with California or any of the other states where they randomly let everybody issue it and, and prescribe it. And that's not what we want here in New Hampshire. Three facilities, just fine and dandy. Let's give it a try. Let's give it a chance and see how it works out. If it doesn't work out, we'll come back later on and do something about it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Representative. Can you tell me that Robin has your identification on record? Bob's uh, Representative Bariso, I think, wanted to speak now. Thank you, Senator Bradley. It was first to not pass up the opportunity. So, uh, I am Phil Riazzo, representative in West Manchester. And uh, House Bill 442 is a bill that would allow sick and dying patients in New Hampshire access to a medication that can either help them with the very fight for their lives or help them to obtain some relief in their final days. The bill is simply about patients' rights and the relationship between that person and their doctor. I've lost two grandparents to cancer, and I'm sure I'll lose other members to it. I challenge anyone in this room with a sick and dying relative to sit here and tell me they would go against their doctor's recommendation during a health crisis, especially if it meant life or death for them or their loved one, or because the federal government refused to allow the states access to any given drug. What I find most disturbing is while states like New Hampshire struggle with making this available to our sick and dying, the federal government has been operating their own program all along. <coughs> they even have their own medical marijuana farm in Mississippi. So why do we continue to allow them to tell us our sick and dying can't use it while they grow it for their own designees. How can anyone hold up federal law as the reason to oppose this while they're being so duplicitous? We don't want government-run health care for a reason. They shouldn't be involved in the decision-making of doctor-patient relationships. Now, something most people don't know is that New Hampshire once had its own medical marijuana law, and it lasted for nearly 20 years. In 1981, a staunch conservative Republican senator put forward Senate Bill 21. Senator Sanborn, not this Senator Sanborn, uh, was a man in his late 60s who, at the request of a sick and dying constituent and her doctor, sponsored the bill. While researching the background on the New Hampshire's uh, law, his widow disclosed that he did it because it was the right thing to do. Please do the same. I found other interesting connections from this bill to that one. When it was heard by this committee back in 1981, it was also chaired by a very strong Republican. Her name was Vesta Roy. Her committee unanimous, unanimously passed this measure, and I respectfully ask nothing less from this committee. It was signed into law by Governor Hugh Gallon and stayed in effect until 1999. It was killed with a simple amendment. From that time until now, countless sick and dying New Hampshire residents and their families have been subjecting themselves to the criminal element and potential prosecution in order to save their lives or obtain relief. This year, according to the American Cancer Society, 7,810 New Hampshire residents will be diagnosed with cancer. 2,660 of them will die from it. If we do the math, a conservative estimate would show roughly 85,000 people over the last 13 years without this law may have jeopardized their safety and freedom to obtain it. My friend, Representative John Reagan, says if we look at the cost of medication the state pays for in respect to certain patients, this measure may actually save the state a million dollars every month. We also have our military veterans to consider here. If you go to the VA hospital and take a deep breath, you'll soon realize this medication is being utilized there as well. Do we really want to see these people arrested? The Veterans Administration doesn't think so and issued a directive that allows it to be used in the VA hospitals of the states that have this law in place. I ask you to support them. Now, law enforcement will always have the duty to protect and serve, and these are the most vulnerable people they should be protecting and serving. Officers still have the ability to continue current practices. This only takes away a revenue stream from drug dealing criminals. Now, in 1998, prior to the bill that passed the House and Senate, vetoed by the governor and lost by two veto overrides, there was a poll taken. 71% of New Hampshire residents then supported this. 87% Democrats, 56 Republicans. That number has gone up. This is not something that people are concerned about when it comes to drug policy. They understand the issue and they want to see their loved ones be able to have full access to anything 
that will give them uh, relief or help them fight their, 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 their battle. So that's all that I have, and I submitted a, a packet regarding Senate Bill 21, the calendar from the House and the Senate, actually the journal from the House and the Senate, the amendment that killed it, the, uh, the executive summary from the National Institute of Medicine, who was the sponsor of the study that the government did on this, who says that using cannabinoids is, is a favorable thing to do. I also submitted the, uh, the drug death data that Senator uh, Attorney, Attorney General Kelly Ayotte submitted in 2006 that shows what prescription drugs people have died from in that, in that time frame. This was not one of them. And uh, then there's the facts from the Cancer Cancer Society. <coughs> I thank you very much and ask that you pass 442. Thank you, Representative Guizzo. Uh, a couple of more reps who have signed up and don't wish to speak, Representative Manus from Gary and um, uh, Representative McKay uh, do not wish to speak. I believe I've gotten through all the state reps who have signed up and wish to speak. Representative Pillian. Briefly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Election hanging others. I'm Jim Pillian. I call myself a polyatrician, but that's okay. From Belmont. I have a one minute story and a one minute comment, if I may. The, I have in my, my record the March 3rd, 1981 report or the report of that period with another house bill, which talked about everything that I was needing for information, but I'm going to not bore you with that. I had a patient call me, it was about two years ago, and she said, I'm sick and I need help. It happened to be a friend of mine anyway, so I went to see her, and she was diagnosed already with cancer and was dying before my very eyes. And she said, I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't enjoy anything because of the cancer. I said, well, I'll tell you what, your children, two sons especially, were well known to the local police department and were constantly harassed about the possibility of carrying drugs or whatever. So I said, can you get your kids to get you some alcohol? Yes. Have you tried it? No. I said, well, I'm not giving you a prescription to use it, but I'm suggesting you do. And I will interfere with the police a little bit to keep them perhaps away from you for a bit. Illegal. Remember that. And so I did, and I called the kids, and I called the police. I said, listen, I have this patient who's going to receive some marijuana, I hope, and I'd like you to leave the kids alone for two weeks. And they said, well, we can't do that. That's illegal. But they did. And the patient received the marijuana. And she took. I asked her later, how did it work? And she said it was a miracle. So for two weeks, that's all she lived. She had comfort, she had appetite, she had a conscious state that was welcome to their family. And I could never forget that. That was one patient. I won't go on with any others. But my comment is, marijuana is a drug. It is a drug just as simple as any other drug. And all the other drugs, some of them quite dangerous, are carefully regulated by the state and by the federal government so that they don't openly go into the public. Quietly, they do go into the public anyway. I cannot see why marijuana, not addictive, inexpensive, able to be produced easily. Even the government produces it. Even the U.S. government produces it. I cannot understand why that cannot be regulated as a drug should be and not forbidden to the public simply because of a desire to take care of all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pulliam. Unless you have any questions. Seeing no questions. <coughs> uh, any further reps or senators? Uh, Attorney General Delaney. Oh, 
Mississippi State. Let's go put them on the hot seat. Uh, Ms. Eckel from the Attorney General's Office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I'm a lawyer, though, so I sometimes a problem. Um, for the record, my name is Karen Eckel, and um, I'm a drug prosecutor. I work uh, at the Attorney General's Office, and I prosecute drug cases. Um, the issue on the table um, is not the bill's uh, official intent or um, purpose uh, that's driving the bill. Um, everybody understands that. Um, the real question for this committee is whether the, the law's potential to uh, benefit a few um, will outweigh the law's potential for causing um, harm and abuse. And we oppose the bill because we believe that if passed, it will do more harm than good. Okay. On its face, the bill appears to have a reasonable goal of um, allowing limited access of uh, marijuana as a medicine to a select few. On its face, that would appear to be a reasonable, manageable goal. In theory. However, in practice, it is not. Every other state that has tried to do this has not been able to do that. And we believe, since if you look at other states that have passed this law, there's rampant, rampant um, circumvention of the law's official intent. And, and we believe that that, that kind of, of circumvention is socially destructive. It promotes disrespect for the law, and it makes a mockery of the law. In reality, if you pass this law, you're going to be benefiting recreational drug users and drug dealers. And unless it is your intent to also benefit those people, you should not pass this law. Those are not unknown or unintended consequences. They're known consequences. The typical med medical marijuana user patient um, is uh, male, 18 to 35, and the majority of medical marijuana purchases in states that have these laws um, are for recreational purposes. These laws basically create a pipeline for people who do not have or should not have lawful access uh, to the drug. And it's naive to think that in New Hampshire, somehow with this bill, we're going to be able to accomplish something that no other state's been able to do. I can tell you, as a drug prosecutor in this state, that um, we are seeing the fruits of other states' uh, enforcement failures. It used to be that the majority of marijuana coming into the state uh, came from Mexico. And then also from California, we had um, uh, these hydro indoor hydroponic grows. Um, we were getting marijuana from there. It is no longer the case. The majority of marijuana that's coming to our state now is coming from state-sanctioned medical marijuana growers uh, that are operating, cultivating marijuana outside the parameters of their state laws. We are getting this marijuana. It is extremely potent marijuana. It's, um, it's cultivated by professional marijuana growers. The THC content is very high. Um, it is designed to have very strong effects on its users. And this is the recreational marijuana that's in our state now. We already have a huge problem with teen use of uh, marijuana. New Hampshire teens are among the highest in the country um, for marijuana use. And they also rank almost first in the nation for um, their lowest perception of harm of marijuana. Um, there is a correlation between those two. Um, and we believe that this legislation will only bolster the perception that is out there that marijuana is safe. And in a state where one in 10 people suffer from um, addiction problems, that's in our state, that's just drug and alcohol. Is this the right legislation for New Hampshire? And, and that is a reasonable question in light of the fact that we have fewer resources and will have fewer resources to deal with this very real social problem in the state. <coughs> 
It bears repeating that just, uh, currently it's still um, against federal law. Uh, the law still stands despite the passive um, stance that the federal government is taking. The law still stands. Uh, and DEA's mission remains the same. So this legislation of passed will only protect citizens from state um, laws, not federal prosecution. Those are the primary points that I have, and for those reasons, the Attorney General believes that this legislation will negatively impact more people than it will help. Thank you, Ms. Echol. I assume that you will be available to work with the committee after the public hearing. Absolutely. So that we don't have to ask questions at this point in time. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wallace, do you choose to testify now, or are you here for the subsequent hearing? No, I'm here for this one. So you prefer to testify Yes, I would now. do this now if I might. Thank you, Chair John Wallace, representing the Department of Health and Human Services, not testifying for or against the bill, but to raise an issue regarding our responsibilities under the bill, and one impediment to that, if you wish to go ahead with it. There are in this bill a number of uh, things that would fall upon the Department of Health and Human Services to carry out. We would have to issue identification cards to the qualifying patients, develop an application form, review the application material, verify that, do criminal background checks on designated caregivers, as well as an application process for them. We need to track the numbers of patients and, and the uh, alternate treatment centers that they're attached to. We'd have to provide monthly notices to the treatment centers on which patients have designated them or, and, have, and are qualified patients. We would have to issue any new cards in case there are changes in designation, changes of addresses, designated caregivers, and so on. We have to have a confidential registry of all these materials. We have to do a report to the legislature on a, annually on all the uh, data regarding this. We'd have to provide information on clinical studies regarding marijuana for those patients. Uh, we would have to issue rules for the alternate treatment centers. Uh, we'd have to have oversight of them. We'd have to do inspections. We'd have to do criminal background checks on their employees and uh, board members and so on. We'd have to screen new employees that would come in. And for the second time of the bill, we'd have to have an annual report. This uh, this one more specifically to the health ministry's oversight. Fine, we can do that. The problem is that there is no appropriation attached to this. There's nothing that gives us the resources to do that. In some other world of time, back when we had more capability to take on new projects, perhaps we could have done that. That world is long gone. We do not have the staff and resources to undertake this and get it in place so that the money from the revenues could come in and that we could budget it, appropriate it, and be able to pay the staff. There's no, if, if you want this to happen, it's going to have to have some front loading of funds in order to, for us to create positions and hire staff that are going to develop the rules and carry out these responsibilities. And, and it is, the bill is designed ultimately uh, in, requirement that the fees, the revenues, offset the cost of it, but that doesn't say how to get out of the box and get it in place. Uh, that's our biggest concern. Uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at various versions of this bill, drilling down the detailed issues, and I and gave the sponsor comments, and a number of those concerns were addressed in earlier versions of this, but I'm available to meet with you again, as anybody else is in the government. Uh, we thank you very much, Mr. Wallace. Uh, <coughs> I'm sure if there are more questions, we'll get back to you. You know where we live. We do. Uh, okay, one more time for any uh, state representatives. Seeing none, the chair would recognize uh, former Senator Burke Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and the committee I had a chance to work with some of you in the past. Uh, I was in the State Center from 1990 to 2004, and I'll just tell you uh, it's good to be here. 
I might not be if I did not complete the treatment, very typical treatment for hepatitis C. I guess it had been in my body for about 35 years or so. I was shocked when I got the diagnosis. The biggest problem with treating hepatitis C is keeping people on medication. It's a 48-week treatment. And oftentimes, people have to do two rounds of 48 weeks. I was taking interferon and ribavirin and some other stuff. And if you've ever had the hangover or the flu, it's like combining those two all that time. And it's difficult to keep people on the treatment. I no longer have hepatitis C, which is great. My liver had some damage from it. I had to stay on it. This stuff worked for me. As I say, oftentimes people have to do two 48-week treatments. And as you can imagine, it's tough to be, keep people on it. It's really hard. I will admit, I snuck marijuana twice. And when I did that, I felt normal. It's like the two times during that whole period of treatment where I just felt normal. I had to sneak it. <laughs> Why should I have to sneak it? This stuff, it's, it's well known among, uh, I forget what you call it, the people who treat uh, livers. There's some name for it. But it's known among the hepatitis C community that uh, and the people who treat it that, that marijuana can help you deal with the awful effects of the other stuff, the stuff you have to take to get cured. I don't but I'm glad, I, I hope that other people don't have to go through it and help people stay on the stuff as they need to get well. And I believe other issues can be dealt with in terms of the uh, finances, fees, and stuff like that, I would hope. And uh, we have a lot of other people. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Chief. you, Senator. Uh, see no questions. Thank you. Um, I would now, I'm going to move to the top of the first sign-in sheet and recognize David Woody. There's one for each one. I have one here. I gave one to the Attorney General prosecutor. He's walking out the door. He probably doesn't have the courage to even look at me. And uh, you have to make another copy for your second one that needs to be recorded. Uh, we can handle that. Thank you. I'm handing you those pamphlets to so that you can briefly look through them to understand who I am. I served in the United States Navy for 22 years. I held a top secret security clearance and I flew for over 10,000 hours as the senior NATOPS evaluator flight engineer on a PEP-3 Orion aircraft, the same one that had a mid-air collision with the Chinese fighter about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, <clears throat> part of my career, as you can see in that folded uh, packet, I used to ride in a centrifuge a uh, device pulling eight, nine Jeeps and an ejection tower simulator, which is exactly that. They, you you uh, experience the same forces of an ejection minus the wind blast. We were developing a protective clothing to help defend the troops from chemical biological attack after Gulf War I because the time was the same gas on our people. Ironically enough, my son's now in the United States Marine Corps, in the U.S. Marine Corps, with 14 years in, he's been to Iraq with two with the follow up designs of that suit in his battle pack. Um, as you can see, looking at the MRI pictures, my spine is trashed, uh, especially my cervical area. The only reason I'm able to be here today is because I had a cervical epidural last Friday at the Boston Hospital, in the, uh, the VA Hospital of Boston. I also included in that packet uh, the VA directive that states, uh, which was mentioned earlier, that if this state would allow medical marijuana, the VA would not uh, get in the way of that. Um, I, I have to take morphine sulfate, 120 milligrams a day, okay? I have to take oxycodone four times a day, and, it is mo and many times it's not enough. It just is not enough. My fascia pain, my excruciating stabbing pain in my spine, um, and the osteoarthritis pain. The only thing these control is the osteoarthritis pain. 
I get acupuncture once a week, deep tissue massage once a week, which is not your blood massage, it hurts. And um, um, chiropractic three times a week. Thanks to Congressman Bradley here, I have that <coughs> uh, access to that through the VA now. Uh, but they still don't pay for massage or acupuncture. Um, if I were to show up one day and have a random urinalysis at the VA in a state like this that does not have access to medical marijuana laws and the approval of the VA that, and for the states that do, they would immediately take away all my pain medications. That's what they do. I would probably die if that happened to me because my body is addicted to these medications. I do not want these medications. I have no other option but to take them because if I don't, I will be in a fetal position crying, okay? It, th that's what happens to me. It, I commute more to my different appointments each week to fight the pain that I live with on a 24-7, 365 basis than my wife does going to work, okay? That's my full-time job, fighting pain, finding ways to get away from it. Um, that prosecutor that just walked out the door it's so narrow-minded, I can't believe it. And I have a, when I was 24 years old, I had a near-death experience, okay? I died and I came back. On the other side, let me tell you what happens. You go through a complete, instantaneous life review. And that life review isn't just from your own body, looking out your own eyes, knowing your own feelings and your own emotions. You are placed in the bodies of everybody you've ever affected, good, bad, sad, or glad, whether you know them directly or not. In other words, that lady that just walked out the door is going to know about the rest of this conversation when she has her life with you. And not just the conversations, you're going to experience the pain and suffering. So as leaders in this community, in this state, that's something much more to think about than you ever thought before. And that's what happens, okay? And I'm not prone to exaggeration. As I said before, I've held the top secret security clearance. I was the chief petty officer in the Navy, and I'm a leader. And that's why I'm here. The only reason I can't be here is because I had that epidural last week. Um, before that, for the past three weeks before, this medication wasn't touching my hand. <coughs> it was barely take care of it. Um, if I had access to that, medical marijuana, I could not only get rid of these medications over time because I want to wean myself off these, but I can't unless I have the freedom of choice. And I defended all of you people's freedom and that prosecutor's freedom for 22 years. I want to know where's my freedom of choice. I don't have it. That, that, that concept alone is enough to make this you people to work hard to make this law uh, uh, a real uh, effective law <clears throat> that can help people. That's what we're here for. We're here to love one another unconditionally, help each other, take care of each other, take care of this planet, and love God and to grow in our spiritual soul. That's the purpose of life. And if, and if somebody's more concerned about their political career, then I've got to, God have mercy on them when they have their life for you. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, we're supposed to say no uh, word shows shows of emotion, so I've asked. Thank you. She didn't um, even keep it. She took it. She still put it back. I'll make hand. sure, Tony, that she gets it. Oh, God. I will make sure. What a coward. Uh, okay, I think there are several people that have signed up in support not wishing to speak on the first page. And I think first person who wishes to speak is Miss Hardy Marcia? Mister. Mister. Uh-oh. I'm in real trouble. It's all right. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Hardy Masha. I'm from Canada, New Hampshire. Um, I wasn't planning on coming here this morning when I woke up. I was finally doing taxes, but 
got a Facebook message, read through the bill, and there's something, a serious flaw, I think, in the bill that needs to be addressed. Now, my background is I'm originally from Vermont, um, and in early 2000, I worked, I formed a local organization to help Vermont pass their medical marijuana. And I got involved with this because my cousin was in a car accident when he was 18. He's now a quadriplegic. So that's kind of how I got involved with this. So because he's a quadriplegic, he has muscle spasms. Um, he's on oxycotton, oxycodone, whatever. And as you'll hear multiple times, um, you know, it's addictive, things like that. So he now uses the marijuana to relieve his spasms every day. And let's function at a normal level. But under the current bill as it's written, he wouldn't, he wouldn't qualify under the current bill. I have a good friend who's now had three liver transplants. One of the medications he uses um, to help uh, the body not reject the, not liver, kidney, to not reject the kidney causes a burning, painful, itching sensation under the skin. He's gone through the doctors, they've tried prescription drugs, over counter drugs, lotions, whatnot. Um, the only thing that's helped him with that was uh, medical marijuana. In his case, this bill still wouldn't address his case either. And finally, my wife, she has a chronic vomiting issue. She's gone to the doctors, they've thrown all kinds of tests. It's not AIDS, it's not Crohn's disease, it's not slow bowel syndrome. They don't know what it is. Um, her doctor has told her if the marijuana helps, keep taking it. This is a founder hospital. Um, but, and if she doesn't take it, she's only 95 pounds right now. If she doesn't take it, she drops below 95, she plugs the up of over 100 pounds. But she wouldn't, wouldn't be, she wouldn't qualify under this bill either as it's currently written. And the reason my cousin, my friend, and my wife are not covered under this bill is one simple word under the Dilipate in Medical Condition section. Um, Chapter 126B1BA. And the problem with the section is that it uses and instead of or. So what happens is my cousin who has these muscle spasms is covered under this, the B section, but he doesn't have any of those terminal conditions, terminal disease or chronic condition. Same with my wife, same with my friend. Um, so I have submitted a recommended, recommended amendment to this bill. I don't know how this works, but basically replacing and with or and removing the presence of or, striking that. And what this does, it brings it in line with Vermont's bill, and I included Vermont's kind of marijuana bill on this thing I submitted also, which uses the case of or. Um, a little bit of, a little bit more. One of the things that I don't know if they did and to try to limit this bill even more than what Vermont did with their bill. But in Vermont's case, even with a war, there's only a couple hundred people in Vermont on the, using medical marijuana. I'd urge you to work with bill sponsors on that kind of uh, suggested change that the committee will take up or not. Yeah, well, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I would next recognize Colonel Robert Quinn of the New Hampshire State Police. Good morning, Mr. Chair. How are you, sir? Good morning, members of the committee. I'll be brief. I know that uh, Assistant Commissioner Sweeney plans on coming to represent the Department of Safety. Uh, I just wanted to offer a couple of points. I had the opportunity to speak with a colleague, uh, Colonel of Montana State Police Highway Patrol yesterday. And I wanted to provide some stats and just some data that I think might be important. And it, it, I in no way, shape, or means are going to testify from a medical uh, perspective or I need to overshadow anybody who's in pain and suffering. The points that I want to provide is this. Prior to them having their medicinal marijuana bill, um, they had 180 patients. They had zero, zero incidents of drug driving with marijuana. In that year. The following year after the passage of the bill, they had 329. When they started a 
as I stated, they went from 180 patients in 2006. They are now at 28,000 medical marijuana patients. Another point that I want to offer is 74% of these patients are between the ages of 20 and 38, and they hold these uh, green cards for medicinal marijuana. Um, I want to offer this up. One of, the, one of our biggest challenges in highway safety now is drug and care driving. Currently, we're training uh, nine more troopers to be drug recognition experts to identify those who are driving with drugs in their system. It is very, very complicated to make these arrests and to get the evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. I just want to ensure that whatever laws are passed, they don't negatively impact public safety, highway safety to our citizens or those who choose to vacation in this, in this state. I also want to point out that more and more we're faced with drug driving arrests during the day, uh, which causes a trooper that makes a stop that has suspicion of drug driving, to call it a drug recognition expert. So um, it is one of our challenges now, sir, and, and I just wanted to, to make you aware of what, what, what we see. Thank you very much, Colonel. I'm sure sir. you'll be willing and able to report to the committee. Anything you need. I would recognize Donald Wright. My name is Donald Wright. Um, most folks know me by the name of Ted. I'm from Tuckenborough, down the street from your mother. Or my, I'm one of your constituents. Um, I've lived in New Hampshire all my life. I spent four years in the Coast Guard. Another three years in the Army National Guard here in New Hampshire. In 1991, I was married. In 1993, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was stage one in the beginning. The following year, it became stage four when it moved into her lymph system. She's since uh, been categorized as stage four metastatic disease with metastatic disease which at the time was basically a gut sign. Uh, I'll spare you too many details, but you should hear some of the story. Um, we almost lost her back in 2000 when they decided to go through high-dose chemotherapy and autologous uh, bone marrow transplant. Um, the problem there was you start the, the therapy at home and um, she lost 17 pounds in the first week. She couldn't keep anything down. Nothing worked. Composine, there was a list of drugs that they tried to work with, and nothing worked. The doctor took me out in the hall and said, try marijuana, we're pretty sure that will work. Which, to me, coming from a law enforcement background, was not a good idea, but if it's gonna save my wife's life, um, in the fall of 2007, we discovered that the disease has now moved into the bones of her pelvis, her hip, actually fractured her pelvis, her hip, and her back. And she has two, had tumors on her lung. She was um, blessed to get into a phase one clinical trial that's down at Dana Farber right now that has literally saved her life. Um, you can't even see it on the scan. She has CAT scans every nine weeks. But the medication that they're giving her, and she's been on this trial for two years now. And the medication causes a great deal of nausea. And again, we're told, try marijuana. It works, because nothing else works. So being in Massachusetts and having some friends down there and knowing that it's been decriminalized down there, she tried it, and it worked. Sat down, had dinner, finished her dinner, was fine. But this works, I know. And really, that's all I've got to say. If we can save her life, she's got the problem. One of the problems is she's lost 32 pounds in the last six months. And 
if she loses any more weight, they'll take her off the trial. She'll take her off the trial. She's we're lost. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would next recognize uh, Dennis. Dennis Barber, I live in Hampstead, New Hampshire, with my 11 year old son and my wife, Charlene. Um, in September of last year, I was diagnosed with stage 4 kidney cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and it had metastasized in my collarbone. Um, since September, I've had to go through a complete nephrectomy, which is the left kidney had to be totally removed. Um, the pain from the bones being unsettled by the cancer migrating to my collarbone. Still daily on a daily basis. The chemotherapy prescribed because kidney cancer doesn't respond to conventional radiation therapy or other types of chemo. I have to take Sutent, um, which is a 28-day regimen with a 14-day break. I've been doing that for about five months now. Um, my family has to watch this every single day. Violent nausea, the pain. Um, I'm allergic to acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Um, registered with the doctors, I get bad blocky hives. <clears throat> the opiates that they have me on now that don't really control is morphine sulfate, um, makes me violently ill, but it's the lesser of evil, and oxycodone, both highly addictive. Um, with the help of my doctor um, and the support of my family, they flew me to California in January um, for three weeks. <clears throat> Because it's legal there for medicinal use, I got to know from my doctor. All my doctors, by the way, all five of them, oncologists and Brigham and Women's, Dan and Barbara, um, are totally on board with the medicinal value of marijuana. Um, when I got there, I was on morphine four times a day, the oxycodone four times a day, all while developing a deeper addiction and a higher tolerance to these medicines. Um, the marijuana was, it was, it was like night and day. It, the pain, the nausea, it was all greatly diminished by the use of this cannabis. And I was there for three weeks. Um, I was able to come off the morphine as a result of, of the cannabis. Now I'm looking at, um, you know, listening to, to all of these statistics about how bad it is for, uh, you know, crime and all that. I, I, I pay attention to Oxycontin, highly addictive, always in the news. A lot of drugs came to keep it in the store because they've been raw. Um, I'm just saying, my quality of life um, at this point has been really miserable since I was diagnosed. Um, and all the doctors are saying that at this point, with my condition, it should be all about quality of life. I'm 51. I'm not the 18 to 35 guys, though. Um, you know, as I said, my son and my wife have to watch this every single day. And being allergic to all of the other conventional pain meds, I have no other choice but to either move out of the state, go somewhere where it's where it's legal. And I, I'll admit, um, looking at this bill and looking at the way it's run in California, California is very sloppy. It's very, it, it's it's completely abused there. And I think this bill covers a lot of the issues and deficiencies um, that they're dealing with right now. Um, I just wanted to go on record and say that you, you know I, I this really hurts not just me but my entire family has to watch this something so easily and readily available and has such an impact on pain and suffering, I would just ask you to consider that. I think anybody that's against the bill, if they had to watch what my wife and son watch every single day, it would change their mind and heartbeat, you know, given, the, given the, the pros and cons on both sides of the fence. Marijuana, medical use of marijuana, I think, is the lesser of all things. Thank you very much, sir. I would now recognize Ellen McLaughlin. One was a 26-year-old woman 
um, who was in the nursing home, I was pre-nursing at the time, um, and she could move her head like that and the rest of her body functions were all tubes and this and that. The other person um, had, um, he had problems, but then one night he threw up. And since that time, he has never walked again and he has been in a wheelchair. Um, so being told that these problems that I were having could possibly be MS um, was a pretty scary thing. I was not diagnosed until the advent of MRI technology came to the forefront. I went from 1976 to 1995, um, and my multiple sclerosis was, was not diagnosed, and I kept it largely a secret. Um, you can't always see what's wrong with somebody, and um, the last time I was going through this, somebody in the Senate, the last comment in the Senate was, well, I saw a guy on the news in California, and I couldn't see anything wrong with him. Um, imagine spending 20 plus years with an undiagnosable disease and then hearing a comment like that to defeat this bill. Um, I've seen it help people with cancer. Um, a muscle spasm, the only thing I can compare it to it is having a Charlie horse. And I have muscle spasms um, in my upper back, my hands, my arms, and my legs. Um, and they, it's pain, it's pain. Um, I was a little dismayed uh, when I didn't catch whether it was a representative or a senator. Um, said that uh, he would um, uh, prefer that this bill uh, be given, be enacted for people um, at 21 years of age because I was 19 years old when my multiple sclerosis started. Um, this is not something we're talking about where people are going out to do something recreationally. Um, this is medical treatment. And these diseases, all, this, all these diseases that people are testifying about, um, can happen to anybody and can happen to their families. And I'm wondering, if it would shift shift the paradigm a little bit for kids who it may be a, a gateway drug, if it became sort of uncool as an older thing, as a thing that older people did and sick people did, um, and it became less cool if it was recognized as a viable and effective medication. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we're now down to the last speaker on page one, and I have eight pages. Uh, not everybody signed up to speak, but I'm going to recognize Mr. Gearhart and um, ask, obviously, all of the people who are going to speak to tell us your story, but as briefly as possible to give your friends and colleagues a chance to speak also. I will, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, folks. My name is John Fearhart. I've lived in New Hampshire since 1980, it's early, 81, 82. And when the job problem, I had back surgery at L4, L5, herniated disc at L5, S1, and it's, they cannot do surgery on that particular secondary disc because of um, bone degenerative disease. Also, there's other medical problems with inside. I've gone through a lot of um, regular treatments with the um, epidural steroid injections. At the current time, <coughs> excuse me, about five years ago, four years ago, I went to California trying to locate work. I went out there and the doctor out there I went to see to continue my prescriptions that I was receiving here recommended cannabis instead. Um, he said the cannabinoid that, that affects the brain does a lot better. It's a certain point, trigger point in the uh, sciatic area. After six months of one puff an hour, 
not to sit around and with a group of people, and I am far from the 18 to 35 year old group of people they're talking about here. Um, I was able to take myself off the medications that I was taking. Now, I'm not fortunate enough, I did not bring, because I don't want to fill your table up here, but the gentleman that showed the pills, I am taking 200 milligrams of morphine a day. I am taking two to four per Percocet a day at 10 milligrams of use. I am taking Soma muscle relaxers three times a day and Valiums also. And when I was able to go to California and within six months alleviate 90% of that pain, Occasionally, yes, we all spasm our back. I might take a Percocet. That was one thing. But to sit in the pain, it, it, it's, I'm not looking for this to be legalized. I think it should be between a doctor and a patient, and I really hope you people can justify and see that, that we're not looking for a legalization. We're looking for doctors, patient, and health care for the people of the state of New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Kirk McNeil, do you want to, uh, okay. No, go ahead. Please. My name is Kirk McNeil. I'm in H Common Sense in H Passion. Um, I'll be very brief, but I would like to make myself available if you have any further questions. Um, that would be great. We've heard plenty of stories from plenty of patients. What I would like to say is that about two years ago, when the House and the Senate passed this bill, and Governor Lynch decided to veto it, this issue was a political football. Many of the people who testified then as patients are no longer with us today. They couldn't come because they're too sick or they're dead. This is not a political football. This is about people's lives. We can talk about the rest of Thank you, and I, I assume uh, you'll be willing and able to work with the committee. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Willie <coughs> Farrell, I believe. Hi, I'm Willie Farrell from Salisbury, New Hampshire. I'm just a private citizen here for myself. I represent everybody else that has problems. I've had multiple back surgeries. Medical marijuana helps me tremendously. I'm not here to try to convince you people that medical marijuana is good for people. Today, just some all the stereotypes stories you hear and hear. It's obvious that medical marijuana is good for them. need it. It's necessary. You guys asked us in the this meeting, can we go quickly because there's a lot to be done. We've got a lot we need to accomplish. I'm here to ask you the same thing. There's a lot of people that are suffering. We need your vote. That need this bill to be passed. So they can stop suffering, so it can be quick for them, so they can do as well. It is we are trying to get this meeting to go through a couple of things I would mention. As far as the state police officers, um, when we spoke about medical marijuana, all due respect to the New Hampshire State Police, they're, they're a great force. All men and women in the New Hampshire State Police, and I respect them totally, and, and I appreciate that we have them. Um, we talked about um, people in Montana when it was that was 180 patients that were on medical marijuana in the beginning. And then last year it was reported 2,800. Well, they're getting smarter. They're learning what medical marijuana will do to help, and they're probably using it more, and that's why you get more patients as time goes on. It's just called progression. It's, just, it's natural. It's going to happen. Um, I think we really are the dark ages in terms of education on medical marijuana and what it will do for people. And in, in my mind, it's just a slow process. And Lyndon Johnson once said, there's two things you don't want to ever have to watch, and that's sausage being made and laws being passed. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's the same frustration that I feel somewhat here. So what I want to say today is um, there's a couple other things the Attorney General said and made comments that, you know, it's a mockery of the police department to say, you know, that some people can smoke marijuana, some people can't. I wonder what she would say if her mom had cancer and she couldn't eat or she couldn't sleep, but medical marijuana would help her sleep. I wonder if she would say to her mom, Mom, I know, I know you haven't been able to eat for months, and I know you have for the last two weeks, and you've been very happy, and it's made you feel good. And I know you've been able to get some sleep, but you haven't been able for months, but it's against the law, and so you just can't do it. You, you might want to move to another state where they allow you to do it, but that's what you're going to have to do in order to do it legally. 
She wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say it to your brother, your mother, your father, your sister, your husband, your wife. If you love somebody, you want them to be treated well. So I, I ask that you don't, you consider the, what we're here for, and that's for the people that need it. And when she says, you know, so, you know we're going to pass it for a few, and take a chance on a, a larger scale of problem. Yeah, those people that are suffering, yeah, you do want to do it for those few. And just like they, with the Department of Human Services, we're limited, we have to cut our resources, we can't do this, we can't do that. It's like any progression anywhere. Nothing's easy. If you're gonna, we, we went into Iraq and other countries trying to get these problems taken care of, try to stop democracy, has it been easy? No. Do we have the resources available to go in here and do these things? No. We're, we're doing it because it's for a good cause, it's necessary, it's important. So I would just want to say that please stay focused on why the bill has been made, what the people need. These people, I, I say thank you to all of you for showing up today. Thank you for your service to the country. Thank you, officer, for all you do for our state. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Uh, I would next recognize Mary Ellen Colvin and Doug Colvin. Do you want to testify together? Together? Uh, she decided not to, but I'd like to say it is. Mr. Colvin? Yes, Mr. Colvin. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Douglas Coleman. Uh, I'm in the uh, One of the things we're kind of missing here, I think, uh, going back just a little bit here, is that some people use the word drugs. Now, recently I've gone to a doctor, I found out I had scoliosis and severe arthritis in my back. I also have a sciatic problem. I also have a pacemaker and a Uh I'm a bit of a shame. Uh, anyway, my point is that my doctor couldn't do anything for me except say, would you like some Percocets? I've had Percocets before. They're a drug. People call marijuana a drug. People talk about the complications of legalizing mar of medical marijuana. Why is Percocet not so complicated? Oxycodone, etc. Why can't marijuana be treated just like a medicine? It, it doesn't need all these rules that, that people want to bring about. And then there's one more thing. I have a favorite saying that goes like this. I want to have a bumper sticker made. It goes like this. It says, let your own ignorance shut you up. In other words, we have so many people who know nothing really about marijuana except what they hear. And they formulate opinions on it. Uh, a rhetorical question, you do not need to answer this, but how many of you up there have actually smoked marijuana? and know what it does to you. I have been smoking marijuana, and there's a police officer here. Don't arrest me. <laughs> I have been smoking marijuana since I was 19 years old, steadily. I am now 60 years old. I was born in East Germany by American, became an American citizen when I was 15, joined the Air Force, went to Vietnam, and now what I get in this country is a little bit of the same garbage that I put up with in East Germany. The government should work for the people, not the people for the government. If people want mer medical marijuana, why, are, why is everybody creating all this expensive rigmarole? It should be very, very simple. And um, thank you very that's much. That's it. Thank you for your service, sir. By the way, the VA knows now that PTSD is helped control dramatically by marijuana. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Claire, you are next on the list, um, or would you rather allow some of the other people that have traveled further to have a first shot at? Mr. Chair, I would rather wait. God bless you. Thank you. Um, I have a name down here that wishes to speak that I'm having a hard time reading. First initial R, and then maybe. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Um, better prepare. I apologize. Well, 
Claire, you know what? Why don't you speak while I'm getting myself organized? I apologize. Mr. Chair, my name is Claire Evil. I'm the Executive Director of the County Civil Liberties Union. I promise to be mercifully brief. My testimony is directed specifically um, in, with reference to the statement by the Office of the Attorney General. And I would like to point out to the committee that the essence of that testimony was do not pass 442 because some people will break that law. I would suggest to you if you find that persuasive, then you really must never vote to pass another law in your tenor in the New Hampshire legislature because someone will always break it. Thank you, Mr. Chip. Thank you, Ms. Ebel. Well said. Uh, I would recognize Dr. Richard Merrick. <clears throat> Honorable Senators, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Dr. Richard Merrick. I am an MD. I am licensed in New Hampshire for, since 1988. I've been a physician for 30 years. I'm board certified in family medicine, sports medicine, and emergency medicine. My reasons for coming before you are selfish. As our population ages and we treat more and more illnesses uh, effectively, it has become a more and more frequent occasion that I am placed in a moral con um, dilemma that I cannot find the resolution to. I'm sworn, as you know, to do all that I possibly can for my patient's care to alleviate suffering and cure their ills and to do no harm. Unfortunately, the laws of this state do not allow me to do so at times. Marijuana in the medical world of scientific uh, research is no longer controversial. It can be used safely and it can be very effective where other medications have failed. I'm in favor of using all the medications I have presently available to me, and I'm grateful for the large number of uh, very effective substances that I can use to uh, alleviate my patient's suffering, but for those that I cannot treat effectively, not to be given the option and the tool of using cannabis places me in an intolerable situation of either having to be a criminal and actually bring my patient into a criminal conspiracy with me or violate my oath to do all I can for them. And I'm begging you to let me use a tool that has been shown scientifically to be safe in its use and effective for those who fail to use uh, to uh, respond to other medications, sir. Um, it's impossible for me to cure this problem and to feel good about a resolution by not caring for my patients and doing all I can for those who are the most needy and, and suffering the greatest uh, of our constituents here. Um, but I cannot also bring myself to break law or be responsible for making my patients a criminal. I ask that you very carefully consider House Bill 442. It is tightly crafted. I've read it several times. It's, I have been unable to figure out how it can be abused. It is not a California backdoor it is not, it is so carefully written that it is, I'm a fairly bright man and I am unable to figure out a way I can use it to abuse even when using my mo malignant motivation. Um, I ask that you trust the physicians of the state to use marijuana judiciously, intelligently, with thoughtful uh, you know, consideration prior to uh, its, its use, just as you allow us by the federal government and the state to prescribe deadly and addictive substances, which I use on a daily basis in my practice. Not lightly, and I would not use marijuana lightly, but it would be one more tool that I would have to, to relieve the suffering of people who have failed to respond to other medications. I won't belabor the fact uh, that people exist that need this medication. There are too many people here who have personal stories far more convincing my, than my own. I would ask that you have the compassion to help those most needy of your constituency and allow me to help the most needy of my patients. I don't think that marijuana is any longer a controversy in the world of scientific medicine. In the world where data and, and facts and, and research are king and the only coin of the realm, I'm afraid that marijuana is no longer a controversy. The evidence over the last 15 years is indisputable. It can be used safely and it can be used very effectively to alleviate the suffering for people who have not responded to other meds. Please trust the physicians of the state 
to use judicious thought processes and close consideration before they would use the marijuana, just as we do with every other therapeutic intervention we consider. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I would recognize <coughs> Tucker. Craig Tucker. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Um, I have a pain management doctor. I'm sure we've all seen him on TV. Um, commercial all the time. Um, I do 300 milligrams of morphine salty a day. I do 600 milligrams of morphine a day. I have a big credit for break in my back. In 1990, my doctor told me I would never walk I fired him. Um, three months later, I walked out. If I do two puffs of medicinal marijuana, four beds, I get six hours sleep. Without it right now, my doctor doesn't let me do it now because he's afraid he's going to lose his place. Um, two puffs of marijuana, and I sleep for a good six hours. And I mean, I sleep. I wake up in the same position, I don't think that. And that doesn't happen. I think. I think Something like this should be between the patient and the doctor, not the patient, the doctor, and the governor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, believe it or not, I think we are down to the last speaker um, before I recognize people who have not signed in potentially. And that is Pearl Sweeney from the Department of Safety. I have to go, but I want to let you know that I was sleeping. And I take two trazodones a night, and I still don't think it may be four hours of sleep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members, for the record. I also need Assistant Commissioner of Safety speaking in opposition for the bill. But I would like to say that of all the bills that I've seen, this is one of the probably the best well written. I think the sponsors genuinely try to take into account as many. Uh, circumstances and, and, and prevent abuses as, uh, as they could. What I have to go on is, is what is happening here in the state with, uh, with drug usage and what has happened elsewhere when I talk with uh, my uh, colleagues in other states. Drug driving is a major problem. <coughs> I mean, within the last uh, three weeks, we have uh, our troopers have pulled people off interstate highways going in the wrong direction. The problem with uh, driving under the influence of marijuana is that the THC content of marijuana varies so widely that there's no level like 0.08 uh, with uh, alcohol that you can predict what the, uh, what the effect would be. There's no legal presumption uh, as far as impairment. Uh, looking at what's happened in states like California where they even have uh, tastings and, uh, and various brands and trying to to uh, promote the brands, uh, they're trying to close some of the places down because uh, they have had uh, practitioners that uh, are less than ethical. And somebody comes in and says, you know, don't you have some pain somewhere? And so you get these 20, 25-year-old uh, kids with a trick elbow or a trick knee that are being treated in the same situation as happened in Montana. So my concern is with the expansion of this once it starts, uh, I think there's going to be big money in it to become a, an industry and there'll be a novel uh, instinct to try and increase the usage. Uh, also the problem because it's still illegal under federal law. And there is a THC uh, synthetic marijuana that's available by prescription. Uh, so I would urge that uh, I don't think the bill is ready for prime time. Uh, if you do pass it, I would recommend that maybe an automatic repealer, uh, which would give you, what I say, 2014, uh, an opportunity to either have to reenact it or it would uh, expire. But the problem then is, of course, that once you open the door, it's going to be very uh, difficult to close that door. So uh, I, I would urge you to go slow. Uh, again, I do compliment the sponsors because I think they 
they went to a lot of effort to try and uh, make it as good as they go. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I'm sure that you will like the sponsors and be available to work with today. Yes, sir. Uh, unless I missed somebody um, who wanted to testify a first time, I'm going to give you a, a chance if I missed you with apologies. Uh, in that case, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to skip the long introductions and the traditional things um, because I am actually going to read a bit, not the whole thing, of testimony from a gentleman from Virginia who could not make it up who wants to speak to the federal piece of this. Um, it's hard not to respond to some of the claims that the AG made and some of the Department of Safety issues. Um, and as you said, there will be a subcommittee, but there you know, I think if you look at some of the claims that were made and you think about any drug that the FDA approves and the addictive value of those drugs and the addiction problems with those drugs, we would not be approving any more drugs in this country. Um, and um, when we talk about drug driving, we would take those drugs off the shelf, right, now, so to speak. So, But this gentleman is um, Michael Kravitz, and he, as I said, could not come up from Virginia. He's a disabled United States Air Force veteran, and um, he um, is a veteran's patient advocate working nationally to improve access to therapeutic cannabis um, for the nation's military veterans. And he has some experience with the fact that the VA hospital, or the v Veterans Administration, does in fact approve, approve cannabis for use with its vets, and has been going back 30 years. Um, I'm just going to sort of look at some of these things. He does mention that the active ingredient in cannabis THC, which was copied long ago and is Marinol, as other people have talked about, was recently um, considered so safe by the DEA that it was downgraded to a Schedule 3 and is fully FDA approved for the treatment of nausea, etc. Considering it is the states that decide what plant substances have accepted medical use and not the federal government, this bill is needed and should be passed, he says. And I want to point out again, as actually um, Commissioner Sweeney said, this is the best bill he has ever read. Knowing that, when you hear claims about what's happening in other states, I think we have to just take that with a grain of salt because this is why this bill is so well crafted, is to address the issues in other states. Um, this gentleman, and I will hand in his testimony, cites some federal cases regarding the use of medicinal marijuana and um, just in, in the end, uh, the look towards the end. He says, veterans suffering from horrible nerve related pain that is very difficult to treat with standard medicines, not only get relief from cannabis, as we've heard firsthand from other people, but find they can get more relief for even, with even less pain medicine. Easing the suffering and reducing the negative side effects um, can be life changing to them and their families. So rather than repeat the wonderful stories you've already heard, I just want to emphasize his point is the federal government is already approving this. The federal government has already stated that they will not go after states in terms of their policy with regard to that. So um, I would not want to prevent us from looking at good policy because we think there might be a side effect because, again, if we did that, then we would want a lot of these legal prescription drugs taken off. Thank you very much, yeah. Representative. And I'll uh, my testimony. Thank you. Seeing no other cards, yes, sir. Can I take a lesson and answer? Yes, sir. <clears throat> my name is Garrett Ian. I'm a resident of Concord, and I just wanted to speak on the proposed amendment. That would make it so anyone under the age of 21 would not be able to uh, be given medical marijuana. I think that's a bit of a mistake, and I think it's viewing uh, the issue as though it is sort of a recreational thing, which it's not. There's no other medicines that I'm aware of that are age-restricted. Uh, I'd imagine the alternatives to marijuana, like uh, Vicodin and other prescription drugs, uh, have the same potential dangers in the developing body. So uh, I think if the developing, as much as there is an issue with uh, the developing body being given drugs, uh, if it's necessary, if a doctor approves it, I don't see why there should be some sort of age restriction. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say one more to Sure, please. Uh, if you, ma'am, could identify yourself for Robin, that would be great. My name is Sarah Levay. I'm from Oman, New Hampshire. I'm a registered voter. So what I would like to say is that I've heard over and over and over again from testimony here that when it came to suffering, people chose to break the law in order to ease their suffering. 
So if you do not pass this bill, you are forcing them to either suffer or break the law. People who are going to use it recreationally are going to use it recreationally, regardless of whether the people who are suffering are allowed to do it. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else who has chosen to testify, I'm going to close the hearing and just indicate to the committee that we will um, discuss this bill and the Lyme disease bill next week as opposed to this afternoon. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll take a two-minute break.